Broadcasting from Salisbury University campus, this is WSDL Ocean City, NPR News Talk 90.7. Putting Delmarva first. Stay tuned for Delmarva Today with your host, Don Rush. Duck carving on the eastern shore has become world-renowned, but it started as a very practical way of making a living. Welcome to Delmarva Today. This is Don Rush. Decoys to attract waterfowl reached back to Native Americans, even before the arrival of Europeans to the eastern shore. And at the time settlers showed up here, it is said that the sky could be blackened with the flight of birds. The decoys became more than just a way of life. It also became an art form. Here on the Eastern Shore, the Ward brothers took a keen interest in duck carving, producing an estimated 25,000 pieces over 50 years. So what do you want to take a look at that tradition? In our studio this morning is Laura Botnelli. She's the executive director of the Ward Museum of Waterfowl Art. She's also part of Salisbury University. Also, two carvers, uh, David Bennett Scott, who grew up in Berlin, and also Rich Smoker, who originally grew up on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania and moved to Marion Station near Crisfield in 1982. And welcome to the program. Hello, thank, thank you. you. So I want to actually uh, begin with uh, actually the passing of uh, the legendary carver, Delbert Cigar Daisy. I'll start with you, uh, Laura. Tell us a little bit about him. And, and by the way, how did he uh, pick up the name Cigar? Well, Cigar is like one of the great heroes and legends of the decoy carving community and lived right down in Chincoteague, Virginia, just down the road from us. Um, and the story on his name, Cigar, was during um, a time when he was out in the marsh and he had been baiting birds um, and his telltale cigar had fallen out of his pocket and was left behind and was found by one of the natural resource managers and then he was caught <laughs> so but he is apart from that tale um, was known nationally and internationally as sort of one of the great American decoy makers definitely of the same uh, status as the Ward brothers and he you know just passed away a few weeks ago was there something particularly characteristic do you think about about his work I'm gonna turn to my fellow carvers they okay what about that it's, what, what, what about his, his work his work was very stylish for his uh, own use. Um, it was all utilitarian, and he took that utilitarian idea and prefaced it into a, an art form of his very own. Um, he, he did things that uh, other people in Chincoteague were not doing and uh, around the country were not doing also. And it's really uh, brought him to the forefront of carving in, uh, in that time period. Well, his style and uh, distinctive carving that he had, you know, was easily separated from all the others there, like you say, on Sinkatig and, and many of us in the, in the carving world. Uh, Cigar had a, a wonderful hands-on knowledge with all the birds and, uh, and nature in general. And when you talk to Cigar, you can learn something every time you talk to him about, uh, about the different characteristics, what they did, what they didn't do, what they could and what they couldn't do. And he incorporated that in his carvings, which made his carving so nice. So, Laura, this is a, this, obviously duck carving has, has been a long tradition, and it was a very practical thing at, at one point. Give some sense of history as to the development of this, uh, of this particular art form, which really began as a way to simply he got a living. Uh, very true. So it's, these guys will attest it's pretty easy to fool a duck. Um, <laughs> oh, and, not all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so whether you were uh, early Native American traditions may not have even been wooden decoys. They may have been, you know, humps of marsh mud or something like that that were able to lure in birds. So as the ability to carve and produce decoys uh, improved as um Settlement in the United States came together and the demand for birds became more intense. Um, the decoy moved right along um, with its sophistication and the uh, styles that were developed from in the different corners of the country. Um, but your question uh, was... About the history, I mean, how did it develop? I mean, and what were they using them for? And I understand that obviously wooden ducks in terms of actual using them actually kind of phased out. But but what initially was that like? And what, what kind of weapons did they use? What kind of techniques did they use? Well, again, I'm going to pass it over to the guys that are actually out there in the marsh and doing this work. We got them right here. Well, well, the thing that, that helped uh, establish a decoy carbon was uh, they outlawed uh, live decoys. 
So before there was a time in history, you know, when you could when you could actually use live birds to lure, you know, the the wild birds into your gun range or whatever, you know. And uh, once that was outlawed, then you needed something to entice uh, the birds to come. You couldn't use the live decoys anymore, so you made uh, facsimiles that that simulated the, simulated the species that you were uh, that you were trying to cover, the ones that were frequent in your area. So. That was part of it, I think. A lot of it uh, started way back when it was market gunning, pure market gunning for the uh, the public. Um, I've handled decoys as early as 1840, 1850, and these were all used as a uh, as a tool to uh, to feed the masses. Um, and they would have anywhere from you know 400, 500, a thousand decoys that they would use at a time, um, you know, to uh, to lure decoys. Bennett was correct with. Uh, uh, using live decoys, but um, I think the market hunting predates that too, uh, with uh, with all the decoys. And then most of the decoys uh, were made uh, by hand, of course, uh, with either hatchets, uh, draw knives, uh, and spoke shaves, knives, that sort of thing. There wasn't any power tools. A lot of them were cut out with uh, coping saws, the bodies, and or just um, cut off of a log and then uh, hand chopped. Um, to uh, to re realize the forms that they were after. So as that change from market gunning also became outlawed, mm -hmm. um, you couldn't sell wild game meat at mm. the market, um, that there was this shift towards more uh, recreational hunting and uh, gunning clubs. And the carver who was carving the decoy kind of moved right along with it, whether they had been guiding as part of, or working as market gunners and shifting over to guide work. And then the decoys themselves just moved right along um, with the, the hunting practice at the time. Um, I'm always really fascinated by the different regional styles of birds, is that birds that were carved in different parts of the country have distinct looks um, for, for very specific reasons. Now, other woodworking has this, like furniture making, you may be familiar with, like the Boston style of furniture making or something like that. But for decoys, it's even more uh, important layer is that those regional styles were very much related to the environment in which the bird was being um, used for hunting, whether you're in you know, a more coastal environment, um, with sort of rougher waters or if you're on a river environment where the bird would be carved differently in order to respond to that particular hunting condition. And, you know, Rich is a pretty um, knowledgeable on the decoys of the lower Chesapeake Bay who have their own distinct style, mm -hmm. which I know you work what hard. Yeah. What, what, the what, Chesapeake, uh, yeah. it, it changes style so much. When you enter the, uh, the, the bay at the top on the Susquehanna Flats, you have a lot of decoys that are rounded bottoms and solid. To, ran, to handle the short, choppy waves that are up there and the currents. Uh, as you move down the bay, we uh, transpose them into flat bottom decoys till you finally get into uh, Crisfield area uh, and you have decoys that were evolved into real wide hips, flat bottom, real wide hips, and real narrow chest to handle the short, choppy waves of the, uh, of the lower Chesapeake. And then as you go further south through Virginia, you run into more rounded decoys again. A lot of the rounded decoys in Virginia are originally from um, the impetus of those was uh, from New Jersey. New Jersey scout uh, uh, sports would come down here in their sailing craft and uh, they would uh, have gunny clubs up and down the, uh, uh, the eastern shore of Virginia and they would bring their decoys from New Jersey. So the, the style was incorporated into the New Jersey decoys, from the New Jersey decoys into uh, Virginia decoys. Mm -hmm whereas Crisfield kind of grew uh, by itself, uh, being cut off from the rest of the world, so to speak. Just in, uh, in terms of species of birds, what, uh, obviously different parts of the, the country have different kinds of birds. Mm -hmm. what, is, what, is, what was the emphasis here? Was it simply on geese or what, what, what kind of? Meat and taters. Mm -hmm. Meat and taters. <laughs> Canvasbacks, black ducks, pintails, widgeon. Uh -huh. uh, uh, blackheads, scalp, if you will, and redheads. You'll find a lot of those. Well, we didn't have a lot of geese way back when. Mm -hmm. um, until they really started uh, farming for grains, small grains, and then we started picking up more geese. Bennett can attest to that because he's hunted here forever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rich. <laughs> I've been a very good while, but but that is true. And then at one time, uh, I think the Carolinas had all the geese, and then they come into the Maryland area because of, like Rich is saying, the uh, farming practices and things like that. Then up in New Jersey, the truck cop. The truck crops, I call them, kind of went by the wayside, and then small grains come up there, and then it was getting to be difficult to get the geese uh, as they migrated below New Jersey. So, uh, 
but that, that he was right on you know as far as uh, how they would do and the, and the birds in the area of course uh, the Chesapeake Bay is you know is a, one of our crown jewels and that and that's where those bay ducks were and the river and also the uh, the bay ducks required more larger numbers of decoys to lure them because they were right at, you know in the open bays and all you, you know you could put out hundreds of canvas backs and redheads and bluebills and things like that you know and then you fall back into marshes around Chrisfield and all half dozen black ducks might be all you need mm -hmm. I hunted so, with a friend in Virginia one time and he had a boatload of decoys and he just requested us to put them out until you get tired <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, as these guys are talking, you maybe heard some uh, species names that maybe didn't ring true with maybe what you remember reading in a book. Uh, so there's a lot of vernacular names for the ducks around here. Um, so that's, that's the truth too. <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm sure we could just go over a few of the high points on those. Yeah, we start talking about wadgets and all kinds <laughs> of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Oh, amazing. Um, but like canvasback is known canvasback, as a few things. Yeah. Well, generally just cans. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, redheads are just redheads. The scalp were always blackheads that I knew of. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, they call uh, on. I have a uh, bird called by Lem and Steve that have all the local names for the greater scalp on it, and it was big blackheads, blackheads, big bay duck. You know, that's what the uh, and naturally greater scalp was the mm -hmm. proper name. Yeah. But uh, yeah. yeah, a lot of them get different names: yeah, wigeons, like, American and, wigeons, ball where, crown. Where American mm -hmm. wigeons. Now, American wigeons is, is a puddle duck. Yeah, it had a crown. Had a had a white crown on the head, and there, thereby got the name of uh, ball pates because mm -hmm. a white streak down the top of her head looked like there wasn't anything there, I guess. Ball crown and uh, ball crown, ball pates. I remember when I first moved down here, um, way back when, and somebody was talking to me about shooting pheasants. You know, I grew up in Pennsylvania hunting pheasants, and I thought, wow, this is great. We're going to have pheasants again. And there are red-breasted mergansers down here, <laughs> you know. So I started looking into it. Red-breasted mergansers uh, for pheasants. Uh, hooded mergansers were uh, uh, hairy heads. And uh, uh, then you run into uh, common mergansers or the American mergansers, and those are wadgets. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, I need a whole new book. <laughs> yep. but it's kind of fun. I mean, it sounds like the part is just, I mean, just, it just sounds like it's a slew. I mean, when we look out, I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, but most of the time, obviously, now we see geese, but... but I don't think most people are aware that there that that's kind of variety out there. Of birds, I mean. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah. All you got to do is spend a day in the marsh. I mean, that's the beauty of right now I'm turkey hunting. And not so much, I don't care about the turkeys that much, even though I do. But it's just seeing the birds that are there. You know, I mean, I saw um, all kinds of warblers today. And, you know, it's if you can get outside and just open your eyes to what's there, there's a whole world out there. I mean, it's not going to the mall. <laughs> <laughs> so so now obviously these ducks were and these decoys were very practical things how did it come to the point where you're moving away from um, something that's very practical as opposed to say something that's now artistic as a matter of fact I ran across it right across a quote from from Laura here oh, oh, whoa. Oh. Uh, which said that uh, quote <laughs> the tool starts getting fancier because it's trying to impress people rather than do the job the tool was meant to do sure wow. you said that I guess I did wow. <laughs> I got that quote right there yeah <laughs> so, so how did they come about what does what does this chain obviously the ward folks are, are, have a good deal to do with that as well well one of the big parts of that story is uh, is decoy competition so for well, several hundred years, people have been coming together, floating their ducks next to one another and finding out who can make the best decoy. And that's as a tool. But you do that over and over again, and it's the human tendency to make things more beautiful, right? And if it's trying to show a human who's made the best bird, well, maybe it's not what can fool the duck the best, it's what looks the best, uh, which is, you know, whether it's highly refined with its painting or it has additional flourishes with the carving. And so you keep doing that over and over and you start to see what, um, as you go into the Ward Museum, the finely decorative uh, works that we have on display there. Um, but, you know, it's even a strictly working hunting bird can be quite beautiful. It has a lot of things going on on it. Simplistic. That, that is mm -hmm. not, maybe not about fooling the bird, but it's about the maker and mm -hmm. his 
mostly his desire um, to be able to make a finely crafted tool. Now, you guys both do uh, decorative works and um, I'll decoys. Go, I'll go you one better, I think, with the old decoy makers. It's not so much to um, impress somebody else. It's a natural progression. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, to do art. They, were, they felt as though, you know, just sculpting a decoy, which is what they were doing, um, is not uh, the end result. They want to really impress somebody or impress themselves and bring mm -hmm. out their inner artist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Lim and a few others were, uh, uh, the board were, and a few others were great at that. You look at a uh, bird in a natural position uh, floating in the water, you don't see the speculum. Mm -hmm. That's a little color patch of the secondary feathers that. Uh, Mostly, mostly blues or greens or something like that, but uh, they start incorporating those in their work, and that's what put put uh, the wards in my book a step ahead mm -hmm. of the other, you know, of of most of the uh, most of the other carvers that were in the area. However, there were a few of the Elmer Crow and people like that, you know, that were that were doing that, you know, in the early years. I can't remember. I don't know what well, the dates would be for them. Yeah. Rich probably can help me there, but um, you said those things you keep, you know, they keep doing and just keep, and they get, like Laura said, you know, you had your working decoy, well, you're putting it there with the best, so then they're going to start incorporating little things uh, that, that make them more attractive, and a lot of time the, the, the things that I do to my birds are really not for the benefit of luring a, a, a duck, but for creating for attracting customers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you said Elmer Kroll, it uh, brings to mind um, back when he was making decoys at the turn of the century, um, he wanted to improve his painting, so he went to a professional artist and had his parents at the time pay him a uh, dollar a session to go in and learn how to paint. And I forget, and at that time, it was a tidy sum you know, mm -hmm. to learn how to paint uh, decoys, and of which he is noted for that now. Mm -hmm. Not so much his form sometimes, but his painting is just phenomenal. Absolutely. And just like Bennett said, um, the fellows uh, who uh, uh, really were able to put more paint on something and be able to manipulate it and uh, uh, make it look like the bird, uh, Ward mm -hmm. Brothers, Cigar Daisy, um, you know, uh, Ira Hudson, all of those guys. I mean, they those birds are really collectible now. Yeah. And the early carvers, they had these incredible woodworking abilities that weren't just being used to make decoys. You know, maybe they were boat builders, maybe they were um, doing other type mm -hmm. of fine woodworking. Um, but when they went and applied their skills to, to decoy making, it was at the highest level that they could achieve. But some of the greatest artifacts that we have at the museum are some of the early decoratives by some of the older makers. And maybe they were carved as gifts to family members. And so that family member, um, there's a particular uh, set of birds, a, it's a, a mallard family by Ira Hudson. Um, it was a gift to his daughter for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so the birds, um, the, the hen has her wings up and it has a bunch of little ducklings underneath of it. And obviously that's not a decoy. It's not a working decoy, but you can see right at the heart of it that these really famous Ira Hudson working decoys are basically based in that beautiful piece of art that he made for his daughter. And it was meant to be put on, um, you know, for her enjoyment and display. So, you know, no, just n none of this is happening in a vacuum. So these skills that, uh, whether it was older makers or contemporary makers have, they are, you know, coming out in all different ways. And, and I understand, by the way, that, that in terms of wooden decoys as, as something that you, that's used to go hunting, that's basically disappeared, as I understand. Plastics and so on have, have come to replace them. It's uh, disappeared is probably a no, little heavy, right. yeah. I don't, I don't uh, agree with that. Okay, um, you know, the, the logistics of it were when you're carrying a dozen decoys and they were solid wood, you know, obviously it would be easier to carry a dozen decoys that were hollow plastic. Right. Um, and a lot of people uh, like that. But I have found a resurgence in decoy making. Um, people really want to learn how to do it, and uh, you know I make quite a few rigs for people over the course of the years um, that people hunt with them, and I know Bennett does the same. Yeah, yeah I'm making a rig now. You know, mm -hmm. have it started. Been a long time getting it done, but I'm making a rig for my son. You know, and and we've hunted over them, and actually it's more pleasure than hunting over the uh, plastics. And now in uh, to to help bring that along. <laughs> The boats we got now and the places we can get to with them are, are making it easier 
to go back again and carry our wooden blocks, as mm-hmm. we call them. True. You I call your they, decoys wooden I, blocks? Yep. Yeah, well, that's what they call them, <laughs> blocks and stools. And, uh-huh. <laughs> I'm trying to uh, to bring back Ward Brother decoys to uh, where I live on the Big Anamesic River. It's been probably 50 years since Ward decoys have floated there. And I'm making a rig of decoys just out of Ward Brother patterns just to hunt there. Mm-hmm. But I'm making them a little bit more modern so that they float better. Mm-hmm. So, David, I want to turn to you and uh, tell me a little bit of how you got involved with with carving in the first place. With carving, mm-hmm. I mean, I've, I've been actually I've been I've got my first pair of birds that I made was done in '68, and I've been carving ever since. But um, for me to get into, it, I, I went to an early ward show. That's before the Civic Center and when the old Civic Center was here in Salisbury before it burned and went around there with my mouth hanging open and saw <laughs> these guys, saw J.B. Garton for one from Canada and he had a little sign on his table there, you know. Everything was made out of wood and painted with acrylics and that, uh, I thought, well, you know, I ought to be able to do this and I just went back and and uh, kept trying, <laughs> kept trying. I, one thing I, I would like to bring out too, um, I, I think there's three, there's basically three classes of uh, carving. One is the working decoy, and then the decoratives, and then the realistics. And if you go to the world competition here, you'll see <laughs> just how close that people are coming to actually duplicating God's work. It's just a frozen moment in time that mm-hmm. that they select, and uh, I mean the techniques and stuff are. Or just I I wait each year at the competition to see what's new, what's going to happen this year. So uh, those are those are things. But uh, uh, Rich, uh, you actually, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, grew up at the uh, Susquehanna River. Mm-hmm. Um, but your encounter with birds wasn't really carving at all. It was taxidermy. <laughs> well, actually, it was decoys to begin with. Okay. Yeah, I <clears throat> I started carving. Uh, birds with my father who was an industrial okay. arts teacher in the high school and I would steal away from classes and get down and we'd make decoys. Um, with mine it was the same same time Bennett started too, mm-hmm. um, 60, in the late 60s. Um, I did it for the idea that I wanted to hunt ducks but I also like to work with my hands and build things out of wood. So consequently it, it went that way. Um, while I was carving um, I figured I needed to learn more about the anatomy of birds, so I ended up uh, apprenticing with a man for uh, learning taxidermy in a studio up there where we did a lot of work from all over the world. And I worked with him for um, nine years and still kept carving. So I did learn, I have a good handle on anatomy mm-hmm. and also birds of the world. Mm-hmm. So, it, it, anything in particular do you think you learned from that experience that, taxidermy, that might make you give you maybe cut above someone well, else? Well, with taxidermy, uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it helps. With taxidermy, you uh, you have to go from the inside out, and with wood carving, you go from the outside in. If I know what the inside looks like, I know how to get there from the outside. So I think that uh, c- takes a lot of years off the learning curve. You know, uh, I teach quite a few classes during the course of the year, and the hardest thing is to teach uh, people anatomy, which you cannot do. You have to study it. Mm-hmm. So what is it like... To carve wood. I mean, what is it? What, what is that experience like? <laughs> Wait, is it Depending frustration on the piece or is wood. it? <laughs> is there, or, or is there? I mean, what is? Are, are, are you aware of what's going on around you when you're doing it? What what's what that? What is that like? Yeah, well, I've been doing so much. I can do two things at once. I can talk and carve, you know, at the same time, you know. So, uh, but yeah, you know, and I've, I've found over the years I've changed, you know, changed my preference in woods. You know, today I use Tupelo. And it's because I make decorative pieces mostly, um, life size and miniature, and that wood is just great. It's just such a tight green, light wood that allow you to do things. You know, I try to make most all of my pieces out of one piece. I don't add heads. I don't insert feathers. I try to carve them. You know, all out of one block of wood, and um, that's a challenge. But for me, I feel like I get a better flow. In, you know, in how my birds uh, do. You have to remember, I mean, the anatomy, like Rich is saying, you know, people have to remember that for every action there's a reaction. You know, and that bird turns its head around. A lot more things are going to change except from just the neck up. You know, and Rich is, is uh, very skilled. I mean, I've used one of his mounts that is, is 
probably the finest mount that I've seen. Usually I don't like to go by mounts because I'm not sure just how much the taxidermists that did them. There's a lot of startup taxidermists out there, you know, that, that, uh, but the experience that Rich had, and there's others out there that have them, you know, that you can certainly get fine references from it. And the best thing to do, if you want to make a good bird, is, is go back to the species, to the living species, to the uh, photos and things like that. That's why we kept aviaries. Mm -hmm. That's right. We That's both right. had aviaries with mm -hmm. live birds in them that we yep. could sit and observe. So yep. that meant a lot, uh, mm -hmm. learning colors, shapes, and uh, uh, attitudes. Yeah, what about for you, Rich? I mean, is it, what, what, what is it like to be, to where he, he talks about how he can do two things at once, I mean... <laughs> I have a hard time just... walking and chewing gum. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Bennett uses a lot of Tupelo. I use Tupelo, but I also use uh, white cedar, white pine, uh, basswood, and I use a lot of different woods from around the world, uh, you know, for both inserts and for bases and for carving out of uh, uh, different blocks. So uh, each carver changes a little bit. Um, what was the question? So, so what? Did, <laughs> so, so when, when you're working with the uh -huh. wood, are, are you aware of everything else going around, well, or are you? Uh, when I'm working in my shop, um, I listen to classical music, you know, which you, know, you guys come in the window. Um, <laughs> and to me, I, I get into a, a different, a different world, you know. I, it's me and the wood, you know, and uh, uh, I enjoy and me and, and the, the reference material, and I. You know, it gets to be more of a Zen thing with me. I like to sit and work, and I like to sit and work with my hands and see something progress. Um, and I also like to solve problems. And uh, the best way to solve problems is create problems. So I like to do things that have a lot of different things going on. Just like Bennett was saying with a single block of wood, I do the same thing, but you create those problems, and then you've got to figure out how to get to the other side. And that's, that's a lot of fun. So, turning, by the way, to, to feathers, um, what kind of techniques do you use? How, how do you get them to be as exact? I, I've, I've been over the Ward Museum, but I think you are used to, I don't know you still do, have two examples, one of a real feather and one that's not, and you've got to figure out which is which, which I can never do that. Uh, but what, what kind of techniques, how do you get them so that they, they really look like, like feathers? Well, oh, that a <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> the uh, Advent of the burning tool, I guess, is is a big thing of it. Mm -hmm. um, the Jack, huh? first one that I remember was uh, Reverend Jack Drake from uh, New Mexico showed up, and again, I'm going mm -hmm. way back to the old Civic Center. It's the first time I ever seen a bird that was text, what we call textured today. Mm -hmm. And what he had done, just took a regular old 40-watt soldering iron and beat the tip to death until he could sharpen <laughs> it like a knife blade and use that and, and today we have we have a uh, rheostat control we can control the temperature and all and and uh, sharp and then plus people are paying more attention um, a lot of people when they start out uh, texturing the bird the uh, the feathers look like christmas trees you know mm -hmm. they don't look like feathers but now they put the flow in them they put the little splits in them and and the, and the, the shaft and all is there but and then when you go that, I mean, painting used to, I guess years ago, to use whatever they had, what they were painting their boats with, or houses with. Mm -hmm. But now it's you know it's all fine oils or, or acrylics, uh, or and they and 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 they just m keep manipulating it until uh, it it just looks like a feather. <laughs> the uh, feathers that you have reference to, uh, uh, back then we had a competition that you had to have a real feather and then make a feather. And that guy, uh, the feather you have reference to, is a guy took plastic and actually formed the quill of the feather so you could actually see through it. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, he, he went to an extreme that way and then, you know, made the down itself out of, uh, um, uh, I think it was uh, floss, dental floss. Mm -hmm. We have that competition back again now at mm -hmm. uh, Worlds uh, with the feather carving. We try to make the most lifelike feather you can. That's a, it's, it's a real challenge to uh, make a single feather because you don't have the rest of the bird to carry it. So, um, so finally, um, David, out of all the, how many carvings, by the way, have you done, do you think? I uh, have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds, uh, if not thousands, is that what you're trying to tell me? Is no, it, it's not no, thousands. Not thousands, but no, it's not okay. thousands. Well, when I first started carving, I did, uh, I was numbered them. <laughs> and when I got to 100, I quit numbering them. <laughs> you know, but... Uh, do you have do you have a favorite piece that you produced? 
that you made or someone that sticks out or maybe you kept the, around? The, really the one I'm working on at the time. Mm. I'm yeah. telling you, you get in there. I do have pieces that have been very good to me. I've carved quail on the nest with young and broken eggs and, and all that stuff. I, you know, I like that, but I, I can keep coming back to teal, you know, uh, green wings and, uh, well, and, and blue wings. Not so much cinnamons, they're just not local here, you know. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's one of those things. But like I say, fav my favorite piece is the one I'm working on next because I'm into it. You know, I'm get, gathering all the reference I can and and doing all the studying and pick people's like Rich's brain, you know. Well, it's, it's always a help. It's not I a don't think trip. there's any secrets in the carbon world, really. Mm -hmm. I think all a good bunch. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Rich? Any particular work you did that, that stands out to you? Jeez, uh, uh, I, I share the opinion of an expert, uh, but I think my biggest uh, thing is the something I have to do a lot of reference on, get in and, and do a lot of book work and internet work. And Unlike Bennett, I, I keep a copious record of every bird that I produce um, and uh, where it goes and people call me, uh, I've had people call me, you know, uh, a bird that I did 40 years ago and ask, where is it at? You know, who, who, where did, I've got it, where, where did it come from? So I can go back into my records and tell them. And I've done pro, I'm pushing 4,000 birds now. Wow. So, it keeps uh, me off the street now, the pool hall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no pool halls in Marion, so I'm not sure how that works out. <laughs> so, so what do you think is, that, is, so what do you see as the future of, of, of duck carving, decoy carving? Is there changes you think going to come down the road that you can see or? Well, I, can see, I can see a big thing right now with, yeah. um, uh, I've just uh, uh, applied for and received a Maryland Traditional Arts Program, a Master Apprentice Program, Laura was instrumental in helping with this, is that I take an apprentice under my wing for a year and uh, I work with them through this program. And what I have done is I've taken a grandfather and his grandson, so I'm getting two for one. And uh, uh, I think the, the future is bright because there's people out there who really want to learn and who want to uh, uh, take this and pass it on to other people. And that's one thing that grandfather wants to do is take it to his other grandchildren and his family. And matter of fact, I've already empowered them that uh, they need to uh, uh, live through this dream and go out and teach, you know, because we want to keep this art form moving forward. What about you, David? Mm -hmm. you what do you see? Any, any changes in the horizon, or what do you? Well, like I say, every year when I go to competition, I look at what <laughs> you know, just what they've thought of that they can do next, you know. And uh, but yeah, we need to keep it. Uh, we need to keep it alive. We need to keep it alive, and uh, the award is instrumental in a lot in a lot of programs that are that are helping with that. Um, I have uh, I have three grandsons that carve, and my son carves, and uh, they. Uh, they really like to get carbon wreck when I'm busiest. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, <clears throat> get out of your chair. Let me sit there and, <clears throat> and use your tools. But um, that's why uh, you buy just, multiples. Uh -huh. That's why you buy multiple mm -hmm. tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm not giving classes. I don't have any, you know, kind of rich. <laughs> but no, it's um, you, you you share that with them, you know, and uh, and they've got they've got a desire. I've had. My grandsons have been uh, fortunate. I had uh, one won the A. Downer Fraser Award, which was a youth competition at the World. Uh, he won the eight to eleven class as as an eight year old, mm -hmm. which was really I remember that really surprising. Mm -hmm. Now he's in college and mm -hmm. has other priorities. <laughs> yeah, my daughter won the Daniel Fraser Award sure. too, mm -hmm. right? And then promptly quit. Or <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, finally, uh, you've got a festival coming up. This weekend. That's right. Tell us about it. <laughs> so the Del Marvelous <laughs> Festival um, is on May 20th at the Ward Museum, and someone named Rich Smoker will oh, be there yeah. doing a demonstration of uh, decoy carving with his Master Apprentice team, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll be there. But it'll be a showcase of all things uh, Del Marva that are related to cultural heritage, so including decoy making and uh, work, things related to working on the water, whether that's... Um, Picking grabs, picking crabs, or working on a skipjack. There's going to be a basket making demo. There's going to be music and dance that's uh, connected to the shore. It's basically a fun family festival that is all about local traditions. 
We're speaking with Laura Bonnella. She's the executive director of the Ward Museum of Waterfowl Art. That is also part of Salisbury University. Also, two carvers, David Bennett Scott, who actually grew up in Berlin, and also Rich Smoker, who originally grew up actually on the Susquehanna River in Pennsylvania, but is now near Crisfield. We appreciate you stopping by and chatting with us. Thanks, Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you. Our pleasure. This is a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> this has been Del Marva Today. I'm Don Rush. Thanks for listening. Thank you for watching Del Marva Today, a production of Del Marva Public Radio. Production and audio engineering by Chris Rank. Hosted by Don Rush. For podcasts, visit delmarvapublicradio.net or subscribe to the Del Marva Today podcast on iTunes. Del Marva Today can now be seen on PAC 14. For the Delmarva Today schedule, visit pack14.org or view the latest issue of the Daily Times.